I wanted to talk about the great changes that we did to GTK's internals that happened in the last year, but then we met two months ago for a GTK Hackfest, and a few blog posts and lots of flaming on the internet happened. And I decided we should probably talk about that at Guadeg so people know what's going on. Which was the GTK 4 versioning... I'm calling it a theater now, but maybe there's a better word for it. So who knows what I'm talking about? So I can assume everybody has read about it. Who? And who has an idea what the discussion was about in detail? That's at least a few people. That's nice. So I go describe that. So the thing is, when we when we did GTK three, we thought we would have this new and improved GTK3 where we could implement new features and just like GTK2, build on top of them, keep API stable and all would be fine. And the old GTK2 would be old and nobody would want to use it because it was just outdated. Bad software from years past that nobody ever wants to use. And then reality happened and people complained about GTK3 features breaking their applications all the time, and people complained about GTK3 not getting all the features that they were expecting GTK3 to get, and people complained that because of all of that they kept using GTK2, but GTK2 was not getting all the features that they wanted. So why is there still no Wayland backend for GTK2 and why is GTK3 still not stable? These were all the complaints and what was happening was that we realized that it's really, really hard to do all these changes that people like about a modern toolkit without breaking stuff. And we realized that it's very easy to not break stuff if you don't change anything. Which is what GTK2 is about. Like, GTK2 still works, GTK2 gets nice bug fixes, there's new releases about it, but it doesn't get any new features, it's just GTK2. People are very happy about it because Firefox has always worked with GTK2 and nothing ever broke, and it was great. Well, Firefox broke, but not the GTK2 part. And then they ported it to GTK3, and now everything breaks, and all the Firefox people complain about GTK3, and it's a mess. And when we met at the Hackfest in Toronto, we came up with this idea, like, let's do something like GTK2, but do it more often. And that would allow us to be crazier in our GTK3 unstable version and really do the changes that we want to do. And we could do that even by allowing us to break APIs all the time, maybe. And we were very excited about that and discussed for it for a day. And then we wrote the first blog post because that's what you do at Hackfest. After the first day, you write a blog post. And then all hell broke loose. And then we discussed about it some more and wrote some more blog posts and some more hell broke loose. And then we decided, well, maybe we kind of know what we want, but we need to talk to more people about it and figure out what we want to do exactly. So... I'll give you the rough idea that we have now what we want to do. And the details will most likely happen at the BOF days, like on Monday afternoon and Tuesday, I think the GTK BOF is scheduled. I think this is where we want to decide on things. So... 
The detail is, well, no, before that, any questions, anything I was unclear about that you would like me to clarify? Okay, so the details. We want to be able, as I said, to break stuff way more than we did with GTK3. Like we want to delete APIs, introduce new APIs, and do all of these things. So we are trying to go for an API break every GNOME release, or we want to be free to do an API break every GNOME release. This will be the, to use the terms from Debian, the unstable version, where we just, well, we, we don't want to do whatever we want because we want applications to use them. Ideally, we want the GNOME applications to follow them. So we don't want to break everything we can just because we can, but we want to make slow steps together with these applications to keep things working so we actually know what we're doing and that what we're doing works. That is the one thing. And we want to keep and advertise this stable version that doesn't get any changes. That is just like GTK2, that is stable and that people can use. And the number that is running around is do one of these stable releases every two years. Nobody knows if that number is great, but the two years number is the one that is pushed around right now. Maybe we don't do time-based releases, maybe we do feature-based releases, like in GTK3, people got very excited when Wayland came around and GTK3 had Wayland support. That was this thing that made everybody suddenly want to switch to GTK3 because GTK2 doesn't have Wayland. Again, Monday or Tuesday might be the place where we decide what to do there. Anyway, we have these two versions. And if you are an application developer, if you are a GNOME application developer, we would be very happy if we can convince you to stay with the unstable version because then you release at the same time as we do and we develop these things together and you can test for us and we can make sure your application works. And this is the thing that we want to do. So this is the thing we expect to happen. Is that the right term? Probably. And so you, you'll essentially have the same thing as you have today, only that it comes with API breaks. So it's a bit worse for you, maybe. I <clears throat> Um, and we have the stable version that people use that want stable software that don't want to think about their toolkit more than once every two years and otherwise want to have it stay the same. You will get also updates with bug fixes every six months, maybe more often. I don't know how much we do now, like the during the dot one release of GNOME, dot two release, there will probably be updates for the stable version. And every six months, we will definitely do a new stable release for the people that want their toolkit to be stable. This is the rough idea. And now the problems arrive, like, there is libraries that depend on GTK that have applications depending on them. What do you expect these libraries to do? I don't know. The people from those libraries are here. There might be some libraries that decide to only track the stable version. There might be libraries that decide to track the unstable version too. I would be very happy, for example, if GTK source view would track the unstable version because it would allow us to 
evolve the text view. There is the question, if you have this unstable version that you can break anyway, do you need private headers? Could you just install everything? That would make it possible for GTK Builder to lot, do lots of crazy stuff with GTK and it's, it's maybe even implement its own way to inspect and debug GTK applications. Sure, why not? Maybe not a good idea because it breaks all the time. Maybe a great idea because it enables lots of things. So there's lots of questions still open. And we'll probably figure it out as we go along. And we hope to start with this thing really soon, which could mean the next release is 3.24, What's the next one? 22 is the next one. So it might be that 3.24, 3.22 already is the last one where GTK3 gets changes and 3.24 is already the first one where a GTK4 comes out. Maybe. It might be we decide to go for 3.26. Nobody knows yet. We'll figure it out probably on Tuesday. So that's the short version of what happened at the Hackfest. And what, what caused all the discussion on the internet is the question of how we are going to do the versioning. If we are breaking, if we are shipping a libgtk every release, then how do we name it? Should we go 4, 5, 6, 7? Should we go 4, 4.2, 4.4? But that would be API breaks. Do they need to be parallel installable? And if we make one of those stable forever, should we then name it 5.0 or should we just leave it at 4.86 or whatever the version is? Those were the discussions on the internet all about and nobody knows yet. We need to figure that out. Another one where we're getting pretty close to consensus, but I guess Tuesday. And the rest of that is, do you have anything to say about it? Come talk to us. We're here all week. Um, Come on Tuesday, come on Monday, or ask now. Any questions? Alison. Are we going to merge GTK and GTK? As a potential thing to do with this newfound freedom to break stuff? The question is, to the, the, the answer to that is, Probably not inside the code base. Like we will have a lib GDK inside the code base, but there is no reason more, not to More try. specifically, are we going to do this so that we don't have to worry about the stability of like lib GDK only APIs in GDK? That we might want to be more flexible about breaking as we improve the backends. We could certainly decide to link it into lib GDK. And people have suggested that because it's not useful to have a libgdk if nobody is using it. And we don't know anybody that only links to GDK. So we will probably, somebody will try it and then we'll see what happens. And if we don't like it, we can split it out again. Do we currently have two PC files for that? I don't think so, do we? Because the backends are abstracted inside, inside GDK anyway, and the backends are the important stuff. It also comes a bit down to the question, what do we do with the private headers? Because we, if we install the private headers anyway, we don't need to think about this problem anymore. It kind of goes back to that question, and that question is, we have figured out. We'll probably install all the headers at some point and see what people do with them. And if we don't like what people do with them, we might decide on something. Because I know a bunch of people who want 
access to the CSS internals to do various things. But if you install the public headers, presumably you don't want them installed and used by people who are using the stable versions, correct? So the question is, why not? Because it might make it more difficult to fix bugs without breaking things that people rely on. Fixing bugs is usually, the, I mean, the, the bigger problem is that the surface that could, could contain bugs is a lot, lot bigger because a bunch of people use your APIs in a way that you maybe didn't expect. But it's the question of how do we treat those private APIs? Do we document them and tell people that they can use them? Or do we just install them and tell people it's your fault if you use them? Kind of like, it's something we need to figure out because our API surface would grow a lot, but it would make a lot of things possible. So it's one of these things that comes from this change that we could now do that we previously knew we definitely would not ever want to do. And suddenly, nobody knows how bad it's going to be. I think it's something we need to figure out. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, you want uh, the stable and unstable versions of GTK uh, to be parallel installable. And yes. uh, there are some libraries uh, that use uh, GTK. And for at least some of them, uh, it uh, logically makes sense uh, to be parallel installable. Uh, do you have any estimate on the number of such libraries that need to be made parallel installable because of this uh, GTK stable and stable split? So, in the, large, in the larger sense of how many of those libraries out there anywhere e exist? No. In the GNOME world, this number is pretty low if you go for libraries that are used in lots of places. Like a bunch of applications ship a library, but they're essentially the only user of it. And they can always decide to follow the GTK version that their application uses. There is GTK source view. There is WebKit GTK. And there is GStreamer GTK integration that I know about as the big users that, that are used in many different places. There's a bunch of... Yeah, there's... There, there's yeah, but you know, desktop is an internal thingy. I was told that you can't, when I complained about it, I was told that you can't expect to install a different GNOME desktop version than the one that ships with your GNOME version that you run. So that would mean that libgnome desktop would obviously only follow the unstable release of GDK because that's the one that everybody else is using. Yes, yes. Right. For those, for those, I don't know how many users they have because oftentimes it's the case that they have just three applications inside their own, inside their own application. Right. Right. It's, it's something that those libraries or those application library developers, which in those cases is mostly the same, will need to figure out what they want to do. Right. 
So this seems like a lot of work, uh, first of all, to uh, bump all these versions like constantly every six months all across all these packages. Um, but uh, and to me, the, the, the gain is not uh, immediately um, uh, visible or I, I'm struggling to understand it. But I want to uh, go back to something you said before. So you're saying this is mostly done so that GNOME applications can use these new features. So I wonder, um, so, so you expect the GNOME applications always to track the unstable and um, the stable would be for something else. So while the unstable has a very uh, clearly identified customer, which is GNOME, uh, who do you think is the clearly identified customer of the stable branch? Can you come up with an example that is as concrete as GNOME? So, um, and so, so th th this, this is one part. Um, uh, th 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 um, yeah, maybe you can answer that first. <laughs> Who so, is everyone else? I mean, uh, who are all these other applications that wish to use GTK3 and can't right now? I guess my, my, my point is um, people, they would want to use a new version of GTK because they like their features, but it feels, huh? Okay, so if, if any of these projects uh, would want a feature, uh, they need to wait two years. Yes. Two years would be the worst case. Because they're likely to come across that feature sometime in between the two years, right? So the, the chance that like everybody needs the feature from the day that the LTS is released without it seems unlikely. It's going to be probably more likely Um, yeah, so I mean, so we're moving from waiting around six months or less than six months to waiting to two years. No, to 12 months. It's actually, I mean, I think if you, if you say like we're going to end up on this point between these two time frames, it's unlikely that you're going to hit it on the edge case. Yeah. And if you already wait six months. Well, it, it's not clear to me though why you say 10 years, because I mean, it's not that GTK3 has uh, broken API all the time. I mean, I, I wrote a bunch of GTK apps. Yes, you need to change some minor things maybe sometimes but uh, it's not it's it, it's it's not that you know it's uh, gtk2 or nothing Okay, I, I, it just it just strikes to me that two years is kind of an eternity to wait in software time. But yeah, so the so the thing the the question you're asking is really, can we put all the users of GTK into a bunch of buckets, and order these buckets neatly into will use unstable and will use stable? And I don't know if we can do that. And probably some applications will be right smack bang in the middle. Maybe we can change the way we do the unstable or the stable stuff in such a way that those in the middle can go one way or the other, like by doing more stable releases or by doing less stable releases or by being more unstable, like only doing a new API breaking unstable release every year and only doing it every five years, the really stable one. Maybe, I don't know. It's, it might be, but we need to figure that out, and so, which mostly means we need to make sure the buckets we have. And the two buckets we have right now is people that really want to track the GTK unstable version that release in tune with GTK. So 
these problems of suddenly not having a supported version anymore that your application depends on and making sure that in six months you will still track the new GDK version that comes out in six months is kind of a requirement that we expect the GNOME people will probably do, but others probably won't. And we want to make the GNOME application users happy, but we also want to make the GTK developers happy in the way that we have lots of features that we've wanted to implement for years but couldn't because there is no way to do it in an API stable way without lots and lots of work. Where it's just, this would be really easy if we could just delete these five functions and not, not have these five functions anymore. And there is only two people who use these five functions. So if we could just pause them, work on them with, on something new and then delete them and then do all the stuff we want to do, that would be great. There is also a bunch of stuff that probably nobody would notice if we did, but that apart from the API checking tools who would say this is not allowed in an API, like for example, changing the base class of GTK widgets. Probably would work fine, but we decided at some point that in API stable terms, we're not going to do that. Um, there's probably no more time for questions in this talk because we've already overrun and there is another speaker waiting to start. So if we wanted to continue the conversation, probably during a boff, is that on Monday, did you say? We have the buff on, we, we will start on Monday afternoon and continue on Tuesday in the morning and nobody knows how long it will go. It depends on the amount of discussion and questions and disagreements that we'll have. In that case. And with that, we can close the talk. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>